Hi, I'm Mary. And I'm Katie. And this is the Housewife Did It True Crime Edition. I do have one uh, real-time true crime. I, I mean, it technically is a crime, I guess. But I felt the need to mention it because Craig Conover talked about it on Watch What Happens Alive this week. Um, so on New Year's Day, mm-hmm. heavy police presence was called to the Mall of Miami. Okay. At first, people weren't sure why, and so, like, rumors started swirling that it was due to 10-foot figures being seen. But police have debunked this and confirmed that they were called to handle a riot of 50 teens fighting and shooting off fireworks at the mall. Since then, though, people have posted videos of these 10-foot figures. Uh Uh-oh. But police have explained that what you're seeing in the videos is simply tall people with shadows. But on Watch What Happens Live, Craig very confidently said they found aliens at the Miami Mall. (gasps) So, um, seemed relevant enough. (laughs) Um, but also, like, this case is like going to be really tough to get through, I think. So maybe we needed to start with a little bit of fun. Yeah. Crime. If you, Um, um, if it becomes too much, just hit pause and think about aliens at the Miami mall. mm -hmm. 10 foot tall aliens. Then you can resume. Yep. So, um, I do want to give, a content warning for this case for um, domestic abuse and brief mentions of child sexual abuse. Very brief, but just want to throw it out there. So, cool. this is cool. also a long one. Okay. So, buckle up. I'm buckled. You ready? Yes. All right. Um, so, over winter break, I was scrolling through TikTok and I came across the account of Nicole Wasilishin. She had shared a video crediting all of the true crime podcasts who had covered her mother's story. And originally I was like, oh, this is interesting because I couldn't tell if she was like thanking the podcasts or calling them out. Um, Just because like you see both. Mm Mm-hmm. In the true crime world. So I went to the comments to see if I could learn more about her mother and whether she, like, wanted podcast recording about it. And what I found were copious amounts of podcasts, big and small, responding to Nikki and offering to cover her mom's case. So I offered the same. And Nikki emailed me all of the resources she had. Um, so I'd like to start by reading her email because it's a good, like, overview of the case and, like, Nikki's involvement in the case and, like, her point of view of the case. Um, And so, like, she's been working, like, tirelessly to bring justice to her mother's case and to get it looked at closer, so I'm going to read you what she sent me, or part of it, it's not the whole thing. So her email reads, My name is Nikki, and I'm the daughter of a murdered woman. In 1993, when I was 10 years old and sleeping, my mother was shot and killed by her boyfriend in a domestic violence altercation, one which everybody has with their boyfriend or girlfriend at least once in their life. Only difference is my mother's boyfriend grabbed a gun and my mother's life was lost. It's been 30 years and no charges have been filed. The Sedona Police Department likes to tell my family the reasoning is due to insufficient evidence. It will take me 28 years to become involved. I'll have to grow up before I request a case file and find out what happened to my mother's investigation or lack thereof. In 2020, I requested the case file and tagged in. Since then, I had a famous podcaster, Sarah Turney, tell me that I was going to have to start a TikTok channel. I did, and through that TikTok channel, I got my mother's case on local Fox 10 News, and so far, 15 true crime podcasts and a documentary are being made by 314 Bird Studios. Thank you so much. Sincerely, daughter of a murdered woman, Nikki. So I think that what Nikki is doing for her mother's case is obviously 
admirable and on one hand like expected this is her mother she lost her when she was 10 years old of course she wants to see the case solved and wants to do everything she can to help but on the other hand it's extremely frustrating and should probably be completely unnecessary because as you will see this case should have been solved a long time ago so are you ready yes like, I, i'm ready <laughs> I've said several times I'm ready. <laughs> no, no, that's not what I meant. <laughs> um, all right. So on July 9th, 1993, Stephanie Wasilishin, who went by Stacy, and her live-in boyfriend, Russell Peterson, got into an argument. By the time police were called to the scene, they were aware that a domestic violence situation had resulted in the death of one of the parties. As they entered the Brown single family home, they noted the exterior lights were on. There was a sports car in the front and a truck in the back of the home. They found wood splintered on the walkway and a bullet hole and bullet jacket in the wall to the right of the front door between the window and the front door, which appeared to have gone through the window curtain. They also noticed a glass of beer on the end table by the couch and a glass of wine on the coffee table. Peterson would later confirm he, that he had brought home a bottle of Jordan wine from work and that he and Stacy had each enjoyed two glasses of it. According to Peterson's account of events at the time of his first interview, he and Stacy had both gone into work that day with Stacy leaving to get home at 5.30 and Russell catching a ride home at around 11 p.m. with a coworker named Susie and her boyfriend. On the way home, he claims Stacy called him three separate times. When he arrived home, he claimed that Stacy had already been, quote, stewing and brewing. And as he sat on the couch, he says, she said to him, Russell, you fucking stink. So oh. he, went to, he went to take a shower. Um, then he sat down with her again to discuss a phone call she had had with Nicole's father, Craig and an upcoming trip Russell had to Ithaca, New York. So Russell had been accepted to a taste of Cordon Bleu at Cornell University. And he said that like when they were talking about all of this, that the conversation wasn't particularly argumentative or heated, but that his trip had been something that had been frustrating Stacy for a while. It's also like, alleged i guess or people have said that in the phone call that stacy had with craig I, craig said this i guess technically um that they did talk about getting back together they talked mm -hmm. about her potentially leaving russell and getting back together with craig and so like it's believed even though he's saying that it wasn't a heated like or an argument or a fight that she was frustrated about the trip and he was frustrated about the phone call to Craig and that it probably was heated in some way. Sure. Um, next, he claims Stacy stood to go to the bedroom and shortly returned with Peterson's gun, which he says she pointed at him, said, Russell, I'm going to shoot you. He then claims she shot at him and he immediately followed her down the hallway and into the bedroom where they stopped in front of the closet. He says Stacy held the gun up again and said, Russell, I'm going to kill you. He says he grabbed her hand and a struggle ensued, ending with the gun going off, dropping, and Stacy hitting the ground face down. He calls this struggle a point of darkness and says he doesn't remember exactly what happened, but that at the point when Stacy was fatally shot, he couldn't have been close to her anymore because he was able to see her legs buckle. So they're struggling over the gun and it accidentally goes off, but he's also nowhere near her. Okay. He says. So is he like insinuating that like, I, I get that you're saying it doesn't make sense, but mm -hmm. when he says, I wasn't close to her anymore. Is he trying to say like, so she shot herself? Yes. Like so I like, stepped, I stepped backwards yes. and then she shot herself. So at first in the interview, he literally says, I will not say she shot herself. 
and I will not say I shot her. Okay. Because he is at this point saying that I the don't gun know. went off in the struggle. He doesn't sure. know what happened. But then in the same interview, he says, you know what? Actually, now that I'm thinking about it, I, was I able couldn't, to see her it legs. couldn't have been me because I saw her legs buckle under her. And so, okay. and he said, I must have been farther away from her. Okay. Um, he says that he saw her head, saw her hit her head on the TV and then fall to the ground. After Stacy went down, Russell admitted that he attempted to hide the gun before calling 911 as he did not want to be accused of murder. So the, the bullet hole mm-hmm. in her, mm-hmm. uh, still going to be there. Right. In the house. It's almost as if. That you're in. Right. So they can still tell that she was shot. <laughs> exactly. Um, he also says, at, this is the point where he says he's not totally sure which of them ultimately pulled the trigger. Mm-hmm. So he's like, I didn't want to be accused of murder, and I'm not totally sure if I pulled the trigger or if she did. So I just wanted to, like, hide the gun, which, like, doesn't make any sense to me. Mm-hmm. Um, then... He says that he looked up and into the hallway and he saw his three-year-old daughter, Christina. She looked at him and said, quote, you killed mommy. Mommy's dead. And Russell responded, quote, no, Christina, I did not kill mommy. Go back to your room. He then says he went to the bathroom for a moment, then came back and picked up Stacy's head and rolled her slightly he then grabbed the gun and put it back in the holster and placed it on the closet shelf it had come from. He says he left it there for 15 to 20 seconds before realizing that he should not have touched it and put it back on the floor and called 911. Hmm. Yeah. That almost, like, I'm not gonna, you're gonna laugh at me, but that almost feels like a somewhat, like, real reaction to be, like, shit, like, I should move this gun, like, my kid's around, yeah. like, I should go put it back where it belongs, but then being like, hmm, they might not want, have wanted yeah. me to do that, but I think then putting it back, like, at that yeah, point, like, exactly where it was, right, at that point, don't put it back, just go to them and right. say, like, I'm an idiot, I'm sorry, right. I, my kid came out, I right. didn't want this gun staying here, I put it away, which means my fingerprints are on it, I understand I fucked right. up your crime scene, whatever but like putting it back is a little silly. yes but I, but think, I honestly I think it feels it sounds, like something I would do yes but but like <laughs> I don't know I think it either sounds like a reasonable panic reaction or right. it sounds like a really good way to explain why your fingerprints are on that gun when you're claiming that you didn't touch it or why it's moved because Right. Maybe he thought about hiding it or thought about wiping it off and then mm-hmm. was like, ooh, that's not going to make sense either. So shit, I'm just going to put it back. And so like, yeah. Yeah. So he calls 911. The call to 911 came in at 1.40 a.m. according to police records. Like they, on their call records, they got the call at 1.40 However, according to Russell's phone bill, which he was able to hand into the police himself, he had made an additional phone call at 1.36 a.m. to Glendale, Arizona, where his parents lived. So the police department he called at 1.40 a.m. was the Sedona Police Department. Um, So in his phone bill, where it it logged all of his, like, long-distance calls, he had one four minutes earlier than the 911 call to Glendale, Arizona, where his parents lived. Okay. So we are going to, to like to his parents' phone. It so it doesn't say the phone number it's to, it just says to Glendale, Arizona. But in on Nicole's TikTok, she says that the phone call was to his parents. Okay. I have a question that I know mm-hmm. you're not able to answer, but it's just a thought. I don't know how this would come up on a phone bill, but, like, is it somehow possible that he called 911, they incorrectly sent him to, like, the wrong city, 
and then he called again. But I feel like you would say that, right? Like you would say like these yeah. were both nine one one calls. They made a mistake. I don't know, because I know like Maybe. when you call nine one one, they like track where your phone is, and like what if he had a Glendale area code or like mm-hmm. I don't know, but I don't it was know a it was home show. phone, so I don't think it could oh, have a Glendale right. area code because it's the nineties. Plus, yeah, I also don't know how that like if it it I don't I wouldn't assume it would show on a bill to the city that you got dispatched to right like yeah showed on the bill where you called originally so i don't know yeah. anyway um so we're gonna listen to the 911 call uh i need help what can i help sir uh there has been a uh, very bad accident we're at 5.30 coffee flat drive. It's just the owner. Mm-hmm. Okay, how many vehicles? No, there's no vehicles. Me and my wife, we were in an argument, and uh, she's hurt. She's hurt very bad. I need help. Okay, what's wrong with her? She's been shot. She was shot? Yes. Who shot her? Uh, we were... I don't know who. You don't know who shot her? I might have. She might have shot herself. Okay. Yeah. How old is she? She's 20. Uh, she's 31 years old. 32. 32? Yes. And where is she at right now? She's in our bedroom. Okay. Is, are you at a hot drive? Five. No, okay. Is that a house or is that a company? It's a house. Okay. And is she conscious? Uh, no. She's unconscious? Yes. Is she breathing? Um, no, it doesn't look like she's breathing. Okay. Stay on the line. I'm going to connect the PD to you and I'm going to get the paramedics going, okay? She needs help. What is your name? My name is Russell Peterson. Do you know how to do CPR? Um, no, but I don't. Okay, stay on the line with me. Just a moment. Okay. Mr. Peterson, where is she shot? Perfect. It looks like she's, uh, she's been shot in the neck or, or the chest. In the neck or the chest? Yes. Okay, we had a fight in progress, a, a dispute, husband-wife dispute. The wife is shot in either the chest or the neck. Okay. Unconscious. Where at? Right. Okay, and who are you? I'm Russell Peterson. Okay, are you involved in this? Yes, I am. Okay, did you do the shooting or who did? Um, no, uh, I didn't do the shooting. She shot at me. We had a little bit of an argument, and it went kind of back and forth, and it just kind of went off. Okay, Russell, I want you to stay on the phone with me, all right? Okay. Medic 41, ambulance 11, channel 1, EMS assignment. Yeah, 32-year-old female, gunshot wound to either the chest or the neck. Location will be the Spaghetti Western Incorporated. No, she's inside the house. Spaghetti Western Incorporated. Drive all units stage until the WPD is on scene. Okay. How did she get shot? Rosmetic 31 in the Silver Shadow 1. Did you want to find out what you no, we we had a little bit of an argument, and then she came. Uh, I I have one loaded gun in the house, uh-huh. and she came in and she shot one time at me, and then we kind of had a little bit of a. Uh, <laughs> boy, I don't the gun, and it went off. Uh, I've got my 
my daughter right here. Okay. Uh, we need to we need to verify if she if she is conscious. No. Can she respond to you? No. Is she breathing? No. Okay. <laughs> okay. What I want you to do, we need to start CPR. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can your daughter do CPR? How old is she? Uh, she's three years old. Okay. Then you're going to have to do this. You're going to have to be listening to me on the phone and trying to do it, okay? I'm listening to you. Okay. Can you get the phone near her? Mm -hmm. Okay. So much beeping. Um, I, <clears throat> I don't like, yeah, I think kind of the same thing that like, I get why if you did not, if you did not murder someone or like intentionally murder someone, I like get why you would be hesitant to like answer. But it like, it, it doesn't seem like that hard. Like mm -hmm. you say like, there's been an, an accident with a gun or you say like we were fighting over a gun and mm -hmm. she was shot like pe like people have to call 911 for accidental shootings all the time yeah so, like the the absolute like inability to like find the words right for, for that what long pause happened. yeah and then he said it could have been me it could have been her then yeah. when he gets on when they add the like actual first responder into the call mm -hmm. and he's like no i did not shoot her well and yeah the poor girl's so confused because he's like there's a bad accident she's like how many cars he's like no yeah. and then yeah. he says she's been shot and she says who's who shot her i don't know and so then she's thinking like 
you got an intruder in your home. Right. Like, like, who broke into your house? Right. Like, she's like, oh, you don't know who shot her. And he's like, no, I just don't want to answer your question. <laughs> I don't want to tell you. Um, <laughs> um, it yeah. seems like a bad idea for me to answer you, Miss Ma'am. Yeah. And I think that, yeah. like, I think that it could be fair to say that, like, you're confused. But it's, like, the way that he keeps going back and forth, first in this 911 call, then in his police interview that same morning, he starts out both of them saying, could have been either of us. I don't know. I don't want to say who, because I, I don't I don't know confidently. And then within, like, minutes, being like, nope, wasn't me. Mm-hmm. So... When investigators got to Stacy's body, they noted that there were no injuries to the front of her body. Except, I guess, a gunshot wound. Was it in um, the front? Like, was the, the chest... It was in her neck. Could it looking, have been the side? Well, looking at the picture on the... That was going on the screen of the 911 call, it looks like it was, like, right in here. Okay. But I could be wrong. Um... They saw blood on the TV, and I find this very interesting. Stacy's gold locket was broken, with half of it laying in the doorway of the bedroom, and the and other half laying the by bedroom, her body. Right? She is in the bedroom. She is laying by the closet. Okay. I don't know the layout of their bedroom, but typically the closet's, like, pretty far back. So half of it is laying in the doorway of the bedroom, and the other half was laying by her body. Okay. And you're saying the only injuries are to the back. What injuries? Why does she well, have anything other not than... Not that there are injuries on her back. They just noted that there were no injuries on her front. Okay. Are they expecting to find anything other than the gunshot wound? Well, okay. So the reason I mentioned that is because later, when they look at her body again, there are injuries to the front that they just did. Ah, right now. awesome. Yeah. Um, Christina, the three-year-old... Mm-hmm. was sitting on her parents bed and spoke to the police saying quote that's my mommy poppy killed mommy stacy's other daughter nicole had slept through the entire ordeal wait but he didn't mention that she was there well they <laughs> said like is anyone with you right now i think he was oh. answering who was in the room with him because christina was, was in, in the, the room, room. The so like he saw her in the hallway and you can hear him in the 911 call say christina please 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 go to your yeah. room um oh, okay. but she Whatever. wasn't leaving um when police woke nikki up and asked her what had happened that night she said she hadn't heard anything um she had like successfully slept through the whole thing her mom seemed fine when she got home from work. She said that she may have had a couple of beers. And then she told Nikki to go to her room while she was on the phone with Craig. And Nicole was asleep before Russell had even come home. So she had, she was not there to witness like any of it directly. Mm-hmm. Um, but Christina was awake at the time. Mm-hmm. So as the family was escorted out of the home... Nikki was told by police that her mother had gone to a friend's house after her argument with Russell. That, that That's where she was. She was at a friend's house. And she said that her and Christina were put into the same squad car as Russell Peterson. Wait, what? The police told Nikki that? Mm-hmm. They said, your mom is at a friend's house. She got into a fight with Russell and she went to stay with a friend. Knowing that Christina knows that's not true? Right. And then put them in a car together? They put all three of them in a car together. Is Christina not like, that's not true? (laughs) Well, eventually she does say. Um, Nicole says that when they were in the squad car, Russell Peterson fondled her and told her he was sorry and that he hoped they could keep the family together. Fuck off. Yeah, literally shut the fuck up. There was, so, there was something, and I think I told you about this while I was reading through the case file. There was something that kept getting blocked out of the case file. People, it, people kept saying that they had heard Russell was a blocked out. I think it said pedophile. Probably. Um, yeah. Allegedly. That would make sense. That's a, um, that's so, just a guess. I do, I just want to, because that's like the only like 
real mention of it I have between like Russell and Nikki and so I want to like put it out there that like she didn't just like this isn't like something that just popped up out of thin air I do think that people had been hearing about this but I can't be sure because it was blacked out in the case file that's just so. like really considering that we have I'm jumping ahead to my case next week but considering that we have a national sex offender registry it seems weird that you think that's the information we shouldn't know right like why like i need to know that they were like putting so many out-of-pocket claims in that case file like to like i like me and nikki were like emailing about it and we were like why the fuck would they would someone say that and they just dropped it in the case file like it's fact and then they block out the word I'm assuming the word pedophile, perhaps. I don't know. And like sure, maybe just because like, it's hearsay, maybe they're like just because right. people say he is, but like right mm, seems relevant yeah. to me. Yeah. Um, Nikki did not find out her mother had died until Peterson told her. And she heard Christina repeatedly saying in the car, Poppy killed mommy on their way to the police station. Nicole noted that Peterson's hands were never bagged or preserved before he was able to wash them. Cleaning, when they got in the squad car, she said that they were caked in blood. And they let him wash them to get the blood Ew. off. And then he but, touched her? Yes. With her, <sighs> But so they let him wash his Electric chair! Hands. I know. They let him wash his hands to get the blood off, but possibly gunpowder residue what the literal fuck they did not bag his hands or preserve them in any way and put him in the car with this woman's children covered in her blood while peterson went in for an interview des took custody of the girls and they were temporarily placed in a home with a man named peter corn who is russell peterson and stacy's boss so yeah peterson took a break from his interview to call an attorney or he said i'm gonna go call my attorney instead he privately called his father and then his boss which is when peter corn came to retrieve the girls then peterson's mother called the police and asked them to confirm that stacy had died which they did Wait, is Russell legally allowed to, like, have someone else come pick up Nicole who is not his kid? I really don't know how that works. Like, I... I don't know. I, I mean, I guess they're not going like to question overnight. it that much. Like, it was, like, it was, it was just overnight. Like, okay. and it was, like, through DES. So, like, I guess so. Okay. Um... Peterson signed over permission to have his house searched and gave over his clothes as evidence. Their home was photographed. Evidence was collected. The scene was secured. Police began conducting interviews with neighbors. And it seemed like Russell Peterson was fully prepared to cooperate with the investigation and like investigators were on top of their game. However, Peterson's story would very quickly begin to change and would stop matching up with evidence police found. When they told him they were having trouble matching his story with the evidence, they also warned him that he was edging toward being uncooperative. Peterson explained to them that he was a victim in this case mm -hmm. and had been stripped of everything. He said he could not explain his forgetfulness and did not have anything else to add to the story. Police reminded him that they had been more than understanding through him canceling appointments moving homes, getting a new phone and not giving them the phone number, canceling oh. a polygraph and refusing to be part of a reenactment. When you said they said his story wasn't adding up, I was like waiting for him to pull a Rick debate and be like, I want it to. <laughs> but well, I really <laughs> want it to. I wish it would. The police really want it to because in the interview, he was directly told, quote, we have bent over backwards to show this was an accident for you. Sir. And they really had. You're making this really hard for our corruption to work. Stop. 
In October of 1993, as I mentioned, they allowed Russell to bring in his own phone bill instead of subpoenaing the records themselves. But then he still brought in the part that sucks. Yeah. Three weeks later in November, police canceled a scientific examination that was scheduled for the weapon. The police canceled. The police canceled it. You're you're edging toward uncooperative. Well, I think he canceled some too. Police. No, um, I know, but I'm saying, yeah, we're all one. In they're the not helping. No. After multiple interviews with Russell Peterson, the Yavapai County Attorney Chuck Hastings requested that police contact a psychologist to an- analyze Russell's interview responses before deciding whether to close the case or file a charge against him, and they did not do that. Wait, they just, like, didn't have the evaluation? Yeah, they just said, he said, I need y'all to contact a psychologist, have them, and they said, no, thank you. Mm, okay. We're not going to do that. So, um, we're going to go over the many changes to Peterson's story. Days after the murder, Peterson called police back and asked if he could speak to them again. He claimed that he now had more clarity about the events of the night Stacy died, and My now he has improved hmm, over wonderful. time. <laughs> yeah. Now he remembered that in fact there was no struggle over the gun at all. And Stacy was actually standing near the door when she shot herself. Nowhere near him. He was not over there. Mm-hmm. In a later interview, he claimed and she that she what he... just said Russell. Yeah. I guess. Like what? <laughs> In another in another interview, he said that he was in another room entirely uh, when Stacy died just and hadn't it. even heard the gunshot when he yeah. found her deceased on their bed, which is not where she was. Ain't no blood on that bed, boy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he he also claimed that it became clear to him that Stacy must have been planning to kill him because he kept his gun stored in a place that would have been difficult for her to access. So she was trying to kill him while he was mm-hmm. in the other room, mm-hmm. but instead she got distracted and shot yeah. herself in the neck. And then she was like, oh shit, well, I can't go kill him yeah. now. I'm dying. Um, although the gun was kept loaded in the home, Peterson claimed he had only used it a couple of times and Stacy had never touched it. He believed that his gains were perceived as losses to Stacy. She couldn't accept his success and the support he was receiving from the restaurant. What does that mean? His gains so she's were perceived so as jealous. losses. She's so jealous that she kills herself? Soiled her own plan to kill you by killing herself? It makes herself? no fucking sense. He says that the night Stacy died, he just wanted to come home and have sex before his trip. And it all got ruined. Yeah. In another interview, he claimed that he had never touched the gun and that she had actually fallen on her back. Which, again, is simply not true because she was found on her stomach. Mm-hmm. He told police she was holding the gun in her right hand throughout the ideal, or that's throughout the ordeal. Not ideal. Then, it's it's no, not, not ideal. ideal. None of this is. Um, <laughs> then he said he couldn't be sure if she had pulled the trigger at all because it was dark in their room. So then who the fuck uh, did? What a I'm weird fucking you, thing to say. I am seriously having Rick debate flashbacks. It's it like so dark so I crazy. couldn't see, but I yeah. saw her face. Here's like the thing. Here's what I've been thinking with this. And I like explain this to Sammy. I think that like and we'll see like that Stacy's loved ones say like she would never have touched that gun, especially not with her kids in the home. But like I could see police believing like that there was a struggle over the gun and it accidentally yeah. went off. But then why are you saying all of this stupid shit? Like stick with it. Like it just none of it makes sense. Yeah. From like the get go where he starts he really doesn't want to admit that they could have been fighting it could have been him. So then he's like no it definitely wasn't me and now he's like trying to get it so far away from it possibly being him that it's not making sense anymore. Yeah. 
Um, he originally claimed that he had immediately followed Stacy down the hall when she allegedly shot at him in the living room. But later he claimed that he had ducked behind the couch for a period of the time after the first shot was fired. And, and you then did followed mention, her. You did mention shots to like walls and stuff. Yes. Are those, they found like, one the, bullet in the living room. Is that um, like consistent to where he's saying she shot at him? Um, I guess kind of. So like he's saying that she like came out of the hallway and that he was on the couch and she shot at him. I don't know like the trajectory, but it was found in between the front door and the window. Okay. Um, so despite police noticing the inconsistencies in Peterson's story with each interview and despite him being their only suspect, he never spent even a day in jail. Good. Great. Awesome. Awesome. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about Stacy and then about like things that people say about them or said about them as a couple. Um, so Stephanie Marie Wasilishin was born on June 1st, 1961 in Chicago, Illinois. She met Craig Daly in the early 80s and gave birth to Nicole in 1982. After her breakup with Craig, she met Russell Peterson in the mid to late 80s and Christina was born in 1989. Nikki agrees that they were happy for the first few years of their relationship, but that it began to break down in the early 90s and Stacy began to call her sister Wendy every night to vent about their struggles. Nikki and Wendy were not the only ones who noticed Stacy and Russell's relationship coming apart, though. Many of their family and friends were interviewed to get an idea of what the couple was like on a normal basis, and their reports vary drastically depending on their relationship to each of them. So, Peterson and Stacy's boss, Peter, reported that Stacy had been stressed in the days leading up to her murder about Peterson's 10 day trip to New York. Stacy worked as a pastry chef in his restaurant, and Peterson was a chef. In fact, Peterson had trained Stacy as a baker before they got jobs in Peter's restaurant, which is how they met and began their six-year relationship. Peter claimed that their relationship seemed argumentative, but that Stacy seemed to be the instigator. He went on to say he could see Stacy killing herself, but could not see Peterson shooting her. It sounds like misogyny. I what like could you imagine your boss saying that about you? Yeah, it's, like, obviously, like, I guess I don't know other people's, like, relationships with their boss, yeah. but it's, like, I can't imagine my boss thinking that they know me well right. enough to, like, right. say that, you know? Right. That, uh, um, I also think that he is simply Stacy's boss, and I think that he is Russell's friend. Right. Which I think is important um he says that at work peterson never said any mean words or complained about stacy but she did often speak badly about and to peterson specifically about his work life Maybe he said he sucked yeah he said stacy was straightforward and coarse and was always antagonizing peterson because she was jealous of his success and the fact that he was going to cornell Another coworker, Luis, said that Russell was a good person and that Stacy was the one who would put Russell down. He claims he once asked Stacy why she was so mean to Russell and she said, quote, it hurts to be nice. I get that. Yeah. <laughs> it do it do hurt sometimes. That's but like that's fair. Like also Especially like, to like a fucking ass of a boyfriend. Also, yeah. <laughs> and we'll see like that Stacy has been through it. But, mm -hmm. like, if someone said that to me, I would not be like, that's a shitty person. I'd be like, oh, my God, like, are you okay? Like, what can I yeah. do to help? Like, that's that's so sad. Yeah. And he's just like, oh, yeah, she sucked. Like, what the yeah. fuck? Um, Stacy's mother, on the other hand, said that Stacy had come to her on over 50 occasions to report emotional and physical abuse by Peterson. She said the relationship was not smooth by any means and that Peterson was often drunk and would regularly urinate on himself and throughout the home. 
The family's neighbors said that although they didn't know the family well, they generally thought of them as good neighbors. They were quiet, they let their daughters play in the neighborhood and were never violent. They did note that they had noticed Peterson and Stacy arguing more lately, but they hadn't heard anything that night. Another coworker of the couple, Catherine, said she had met with Stacy in the work parking lot on July 8th, where Stacy confided in her that she had not been having a good day. She asked Catherine to speak to Peterson about his upcoming trip. She, Catherine said that Stacy often pushed Peterson's buttons, but instead of engaging, he would ignore it. Catherine told police that she had gotten closer to Stacy recently and Stacy had begun to confide in her about her childhood and her previous relationship with Craig. According to are, Catherine. Are they like insinuating that that's like a good trait of his that she yeah. starts stuff with him and he ignores uh, yes. it? I literally, it my to me first like thought was that, that would piss me the fuck off. Like if I yeah. was like upset with my partner and like trying to like, have a conversation with them and they were just like brushing me off like that's not good that's called gaslighting um according to Catherine and many other sources close to stacy she had endured an abusive childhood and an abusive relationship with nikki's father it was reported that after stacy's father harry died when she was about 16 her stepfather bruce began to molest her and her sister when Stacy's mother found out about this, she sent Stacy to live with an aunt in Chicago. Peterson himself told the police at one point that Craig had actually put Stacy in the hospital a few times and, quote, knocked the shit out of her. Another coworker, Susie, who had given Peterson a ride home the night of the murder, noted that Russell was in a good mood on their car ride and was excited about his trip, which he was leaving for in less than 30 hours. She had also been in touch with Stacy that day. She said that Stacy was upset because Peterson had been working too much and not paying enough attention to their family, and she was stressed about money. Susie offered to leave work early to go see Stacy and was even going to take the girls for the night to give the couple some alone time, but she was unable to leave because another employee had left early that day. In general, she said Stacy had a strong personality and would cut straight to the point, sometimes being a little vulgar with it. She said she had observed Stacy get angry with her children, but never threatened Peterson and he never threatened her. I do want to say, like, I don't think it's normal to get angry at your children. I don't think yeah. that she meant that, like, oh, she she was a bad mom. Like, I think that just like losing her patience. Sure. With her with them. Um Kay, a good friend of the couple who claimed to be like a sister to, Kay, to Stacy, told police that Stacy was a good girl with a lot of sad problems and internal pain. She believed Stacy was resentful of Peterson's success and the fact that he was married to his work, but that he was a good-hearted person who never complained. I just find it hard to believe, like, I get, like... <sighs> career success is like separate mm -hmm. but I like find it hard to believe that you watch this man piss on himself at home and then you're like but man like you know like I don't think she views him as like as successful as it sounds like everyone else yeah. views him I mean maybe yeah, I think I guess there could be a part annoyed. that's like I watch this man piss on himself and yet he's getting all these raise these like promotions and opportunities yeah. and stuff but like I think people yeah. don't know how like pathetic she probably sees him as I don't because think and I don't think that her even her frustration with the work I don't think it's about him being successful or more successful than her and like and people will say other people will say it's the fact that like this trip cost thousands of dollars mm -hmm. and he just like did it without really consulting her and is leaving her alone for 10 days with the kids, taking thousands of dollars to make this trip happen that, like... She has to he, work, too. Right. And, like, that it just was inconvenient, and it was, like, a decision made without her in the process. It had nothing right. to do with the fact that, like... And, like, he even said, like, they were like, well, was she, like, upset because you got it accepted and she didn't? And he was like, she didn't apply for it. Like, mm -hmm. she, didn't want she wasn't it. trying to be accepted to it. 
but like I think he said like that he thought watching like their boss like give him like a six hundred dollar knife set and like doing all these things for him to prepare like really got to her and I was like I don't think that's it I think I think that you planned an expensive trip for yourself and didn't consult her on it and have not apologized for that yeah um Peterson's parents described him as passive and hardworking, and they described Stacy as strong, tough, and tormented. They said Peterson was non-aggressive and would never have hurt Stacy, but that Stacy could get nasty with him. Mm-hmm. Stacy's sister Wendy spoke to her at a, Wendy spoke to Stacy at about 7:15 the night she died. Stacy reported on that phone call being in a bad mood. She confided in her sister that she and Peterson had not had sex in about seven months. Um, they Why spoke on the have sex that night. Yeah, he does. See, buddy, if all you wanted that night was to have sex, sounds like she was down. Yeah. Other they than being pissed phone, at you. Right. They spoke on the phone again at 10:30 p.m. And Wendy said Stacy was in a better mood at this point. She she was fine at 10 30 she also noted in general that stacy loved life and in fact was a f- afraid of dying mm. so she could not imagine that she would either complete suicide or put herself at risk of death by handling a gun mm-hmm. a high school friend of stacy's named james said she would have never handled a gun especially around a guy i'm sorry i'm stuck on this Cause like, I think this says a lot about like who someone is, but like, she's not gonna, if she's so scared of dying, she's not going to handle a gun around a guy who gets so drunk that he pisses himself. Like right. she's like, like regularly pisses. Right. Himself. This is like often. Right. So she's not going to be like, Oh, I should pull out a loaded gun around this freaking fool. Yeah. And, and it's going to be safe for me and my children. Yes. Like also like, I think there were times like doing this case where I was like, I guess what he's saying is possible, but Mm -hmm. then we get to, like, the concrete evidence. It simply isn't. Like, Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I was going to say, like, just simply did not happen. I was going to say, like, right now, based on, like, the facts I have, like, sure, she totally, I could, I don't know her. Like, she could have pulled the gun out. She could have been trying to kill him. People do unexpected things. Yeah, like, she maybe thought, I'll shoot him, and didn't think, like, and he'll be able to get the gun like mm-hmm. she just thought I'll shoot him yeah like, I, sure I guess it's always but we'll, like yeah but we will possible. get to facts like she she simply did not hold that gun in her hand yeah um so anyway Stacy's brother Lance says his sister had never been suicidal she in fact told him she wanted to make her relationship with Peterson work even though they were no longer having sex and even though Peterson had been physically abusive she still wanted to try to make her relationship work Lance told police he once saw Peterson shove Stacy and scream at her until Lance himself intervened and stopped it. Mm. Nikki's father, Craig, said that he and Stacy broke up because they didn't see eye to eye. She was very strong willed, but he said that she had never spoken about being suicidal. He told police that he had guns and that it was possible Stacy had shot one before, but it definitely wasn't a regular thing that would have made her comfortable to grab Peterson's double action Red Hawk Ruger revolver. He said her temper was pretty average and she had never threatened him. They like asked him like she never threatened you at all. And he was like, he said, um, she may have at some point said, like, oh, my God, I'm going to kill you. But, like, he was, like, it was very clear if she did that she was not actually going to kill me. Like, mm-hmm. he said, people say that all the time. And you can tell when they mean I am going to kill you and when they're, like, just annoyed and, like, I'm going to kill you. Mm-hmm. Um, so he said he never felt threatened by her. He claimed that he did once have to call the police because Stacy was drunk while picking up clothes for Nicole, and he thought she had been arrested for this incident. However, when Peterson's and Stacy's names were run for criminal records, neither of them had any arrests. So I don't know if that, like, whole thing did not happen, or Mm -hmm. she just wasn't arrested for it, but she did not have any arrest records. 
Craig and Stacy were still friendly, and she had recently been confiding in him about the struggles in her relationship with Peterson, specifically that Peterson often drank and roughed her up. When Peterson told police about his relationship with Stacy, he said they worked well together and she loved her kids very much. He claimed that while they did argue, he wouldn't say they ever fought. So basically the vibe I caught from a lot of these interviews was like, oh, no surprise. Like she's an instigator. She probably started it. And here's my opinion. I think if you were to ask people who know me and my husband, they would probably all tell you that I am more of the instigator. Mm-hmm. That like between the two of us, I'm the more fiery one and he's the calmer mm-hmm. one. And I shouldn't have to say <laughs> that this is unfair and that a harsh personality should not make someone a target for murder. Yeah. And I think that like with what we're talking about, like being like a strong personality like seems very separate from would kill myself right and (laughs) so I just I like just wanted to clarify that in like repeating these statements I'm not trying to paint Stacy in any certain way and that this was like very frustrating to go through Mm -hmm. these interviews because and you pointed this out at the beginning a lot of strong-willed women get this sort of reputation as antagonistic or someone that we should not sympathize with. And it's just, it's very frustrating. And I think that like, it is just obviously is not fair, but like that because she is someone who had like a hard shell and like stood up for herself that people were like, she's, always like causing problems Mm -hmm. and I don't think that I think she had to make herself that way given what she had been through in her life but also like she just not taking shit I was gonna say though like okay again just I'm gonna play a little bit of devil's advocate like if she was like a shit stirrer if she was like drama if she Mm -hmm. did cause problems like I'm still like where's the connection to like violence Like, and that's where I think the, like, misogyny is clear that, like, Mm -hmm. women don't get to be, like, I don't even want to say, like, instigators, but, like, so what? Like, if that's the worst thing she was, like, but women don't get to be, like, opinionated or, like, harsh without it somehow being, like, well, no, no surprise this happened. And, like, what? Like, where does, like a violent act of like where does like gun violence fall into yeah. like opinionated women I'm not it's giving like the bathroom scene in Mean Girls where Regina says you know they'd call me if I was a boy and Katie says strong mm-hmm. and she says no Reginald um <laughs> but yeah I think like it's just and like I think what's interesting is like we see we'll see like you see like people on TikTok sometimes who are like I'm about to start a fight with my boyfriend about something silly. And, like, you, they do it once, and everybody thinks it's so funny. But, mm-hmm. like, if you do it enough times, people, like, are, like, okay, now you're, like, a problem. Mm-hmm. And, like, I think that, like, that's even not fair to be, like, like, it's men... funny sometimes, but then it's yeah. not anymore. But, like, like. And, like, even men get to be, like, bad people without, like, you know, yes. do you know what I mean? Like, we yeah. can, like maybe not me personally with the way that I feel about like crimes committed by men, but like as society men, we can separate like, okay, he's kind of a shitty guy from like, he's a murderer. But like, why are we on it? As soon as like women aren't like demure, we're like capable of murder. Yeah. Yeah. I can see it. And I'm like, yeah. Wait? Well, like, and like, even like, I like when we talked about like the Daniel Robinson case, we were like, mm-hmm. let's separate this weird behavior with the text sure. from who he is as a person and the fact that we need to find him. But then, like, you get to this case and people who actually know this woman, who claim mm-hmm. to be friends with her, who spend day every day working with her, are like, she was pretty much crazy. And like, and what happened happened because she's crazy. Like, what the yeah. fuck? Weird. So. When Christina was originally interviewed, she said she saw her dad shoot her mom, mm-hmm. but the police said, no, you didn't. You silly little girl. 
And she changed her story to say she had heard a fight and went into the bedroom where her dad ran over to her and told her he shot the gun and that it was hopeless before he started crying. So Christina's interview with police stood out to me quite a bit from the case material. Um, So my husband and I, it was just the transcript. So my husband and I recorded ourselves reading it with like me being Christina and him being the police. So I'm going to share that with us to listen. Um, I will say a lot of the words in the um, script were like listed as garbled. Okay. So I, I had us read every single thing that was on the script word wise, but some of it doesn't make a lot of sense because what came before it was garbled. Okay. Um, if that makes sense. Yeah. So there are some parts that you're going to be like, what the fuck are they talking about? Um, Because they, like, come out of nowhere. But um, we're going to listen to it. Okay. The date and time are July 9th, 1993 at 441. Present is myself, Detective Walt Spokes, Detective Gary Saravo of the Yavapai County Attorney's Office, and Christina Peterson. Christina, how old are you? Three. You're three years old. Do you know your last name, Christina? Yes, um, Peterson. Christina Peterson, that's your name? Mm-hmm. How come you have some scratches? What happened to your arm? Let me see. You have a cat that scratched you right there? Mm-hmm. Boy, cat scratches hurt, don't they? Yeah. You were picking up the... Bi- the baby cat and it scratched you Uh uh-huh did it hurt did it hurt when you it scratched you right there i see you got a little puppy what's your puppy's name sunshine sunshine Uh uh-huh my mommy named him it is Mm mm-hmm does he bite no he's a nice little dog were you at home tonight Uh uh-huh what happened at home tonight my cat scratched me That's a nice little kitty. Not a nice dog. Not a nice dog. Were you at home tonight? Uh Uh-huh. Did you go to sleep? Yes. Did something happen at home tonight? My mother died. She did? What happened? How did she die? Um, my dad killed her. How did your dad kill her? Um, with a gun. He killed her with a gun? Tell me about it. He killed her with a gun and then she bleeded. Did you see that? She was dead. Where were you sleeping at? I was sleeping in my room. Where is your room? Is it by your mom's room? Tell me what you heard and what you saw. I saw her bleed. You saw her bleed? Did you see your dad shoot her? Mm Mm-hmm. No, you didn't. Was there fighting or anything that you know of? They were fighting. What were they saying? Tell me about their fight. What did you say? What happened? Do you know what happened there? How did he kill her with a gun? You take a bullet and then he killed her. Did you see that? You saw that? But I didn't see. I was sleeping. You were sleeping? Uh Uh-huh. Tell me what you saw. I was asleep and Poppy killed her. How did you see Papa kill her? She had blood all over her room. How did you see Papa kill her? Papa didn't kill her. Poppy did. Poppy did? Poppy killed her. Because I was sleeping, sleeping in my own room. Then I come out and the light and blood all over. There was blood on my rug. Did you see that? Did you see anybody shoot her? No. No? Where were you? I was in my room sleeping. Did you hear anybody fighting? No. Did you hear any gunshots before that? But I just heard the gun. How many times did you hear the gun? How many times? One time or two times? Three times or four times? One time. One time? And then Poppy took the gun. Who did? Poppy. Poppy? Who's Poppy? My father. What's his name? Russell. Russell? And what did he do with the gun? He killed my mom. He did? How many times did he do the gun? How many times? One time? 
two times, three times, four times, five times? One time. One time? That's all you heard? How many times did you hear it? One time. Then what? Poppy killed her. How do you know Poppy killed her? Because my mother was dead and Poppy killed her. Do you know what's your secret? Well, I need to know about your secrets. Because I had a bad dream about it. You had a bad dream? What was your bad dream about? It was about... What happened? When did you have that dream? Tonight or before? Tonight, what did you see? I didn't <clears throat> see anything. You did? Mm-hmm. What did you do when you were in Mommy's room? I walked in there. When you walked in Mommy's room, what did Mommy look like? She was dead. Already dead when you walked in there? Where was Daddy at? Um, he was in Mommy's room. Where was the gun at? Um, in the closet. I mean, he got it out. The gun was in the closet? Was he holding it? Mm-hmm. It was in the closet, and Daddy got it out? Yes. What did he say? Um, he said that he shot the gun, and then he cried. He said what? He said it's hopeless, and then he cried. It's hopeless? Mm-hmm. And he cried? Mm-hmm. Was he already in the room when you went when you went in there? Mm-hmm. Where was he standing or sitting at? Um, mom was um Okay. Come here. What is this? Mommy was in the corner. Come on, you show me where mommy was at. This is the room. This is the closet right here. Right here. This is the closet. Where was mommy at? Um, she was in that corner, the gun in the closet. You show me where mommy was, like where mommy was. She was. Lay down where you think. Show me where mommy was. Just lay down where mommy was. When you go in the door, the door was over here. Where was mommy at? Where was daddy at? And he said, it's hopeless. And the gun was in the closet. Where was the gun at? Um, It was in the closet and. The gun was in the closet. Mm-hmm. Was Daddy holding the gun, or was it just in the closet laying there? Um, Daddy was... No. Was Daddy holding the gun, or was the gun just laying in the closet? Daddy was holding the gun. Was it in the closet first before he was holding it, or was he just holding it? Took it out of the closet. Who was? My dad. Was he in the closet? No. -uh. Who was in the closet? Um. Does it still hurt? You hurt your finger. It doesn't hurt. So when you went in there, mommy was on the floor already? In blood. It had blood? Where was the gun at? In the closet. <clears throat> Where was daddy? Um, he was, um... Mommy was laying there like this? Mm-hmm. Mommy was laying like what? Show me how mommy was laying. Like this. Okay, face down? Uh-huh. Like this? Mm-hmm. Okay, mommy was laying like this. With her face down, right? Uh-huh. Where was daddy at? Come here. Come here. He's on the bed. He's sitting on the bed. Then what happened? Where's the gun? It was in the closet. The gun was in the closet. And daddy was sitting over there on the bed. Uh-huh. And then what happened? He was shooting her, and I'll never have a mama again. He was shooting her? Did you see him shoot her? No. No? Okay, so was the gun in the closet when you saw it? Uh-huh, the door. Okay, the gun's in the closet, and Dad's sitting on the bed? Uh-huh. Then what happened, right then? I, I, I... Somebody got the gun out of the closet? Um, my dad did, and he... What did he do with the gun? And my dad, my dad was just about to shoot her, and I'll never have my mom again. Who got the gun out of the closet, sweetie? Um, my dad. What did he do when he got the gun out of the closet? Um, um, he shoot my mom. He shot your mom? Did you see him shoot your mom? I was in my room sleeping. Well, then, what did he do when he got the gun that you saw? Um, <clears throat> the big gun? Oh, yeah. Um, out of the closet, and then he... What did he say? He said it was hopeless, and... Did he say anything to you? No, I just cried because of my mom. You did? Did you touch your mom? I just touched the blood. You touched the blood? Why did you touch the blood? 
She was dead and my dad shoot her. My dad did shoot her. Do you know if he shot her or if she shot herself? My dad shoot her. He shot her? Really? Did you see that? One of your secrets. Because I dream about that. You had a dream about that? It was a bad old dream. When did you have your dream? Um, um. Tonight? When it was dark out, I did. But you didn't see. My dad shooted my mom. We're going to stop talking to you right now. We may talk to you a little bit later, okay? Okay. Thank you. End of interview. Thoughts? Um, it, like, reminded me of the interview with Jesse Miss Kelly Jr. Mm -hmm. Um, but, yeah, I, I, like, understand that, like, the way that you must do police interviews with children that young, like, must be so different. Yeah. Um, but, man, like, I feel like they are pushing her so hard mm -hmm. as a three-year-old. Mm-hmm. Um, she yeah. She doesn't and, know when she had a dream. And she is, like, adamant the whole time that her dad shot her mom, whether she saw it or he told her, like, she and then, is but very then you're confident like, that that's what happened. You're like, you didn't see it? Well, you literally just told her, no, you didn't. Yeah. So, like, now she's she like, see it. must not have seen it. <laughs> right. Um, after Peterson gained full custody of Christina, she had completely changed her opinion to say that her mom shot herself. Um, so I don't know if that's what she still thinks, but that was what she later believed. Um, when Nicole was interviewed, she said her mom would have never grabbed a gun and never had before, especially not with her children in the home. In Nicole's interview, she told police that the night before her mother's death, the family watched TV and played hide and seek. The girls were sent to their rooms where Nikki wrote some letters before kissing her mom goodnight and going to sleep. Very normal. Um, she said in her interview that her mom and Peterson really liked one another and that she had never seen Peterson hit her mom, but she had seen Stacy hit Peterson at least once. Who said this? Nicole. Okay. In her interview when she was 10. Um, she said Stacy often talked about how nice Peterson was. Nicole called Peterson her best friend and said he was never mean to her or her sister. She told police she had never seen in injuries on her mother, and she believed that if her mother was being abused, she would have told her because they were friends. So that broke my heart, because of course, when you're 10 years old, you think that. But as an adult, you know that her mother was probably working her ass off to protect her child and shield her from all these things. Because Nicole also said that... Um, he didn't drink in front of her often and that when he was drunk, he only bumped into things. And so like, again, we have these people who are close to Stacy saying that she told them that he like pissed himself all the time when he was drunk. Like he probably didn't do that in front of Nicole, probably to the credit of her mother keeping yeah. that from her. Um, she said that when Peterson and Stacy did fight, it was about how much he worked, but that overall he was a nice guy she knew her mom had been upset about the cost of the cooking school and that that had been like a point of contention recently. Yeah. Um, so according to Stacy's autopsy report, her cause of death was a perforating contact gunshot wound to the neck, which fractured her cervical spine vertebrates C3, C4, and C5, tore her cervical cord, caused a conducive laceration of the soft tissue on her neck and fractured the floor of her cranial vault and the right middle cranial fossa. Um, please bear with me as I read this autopsy. Mm -hmm. I don't know what a lot of this means. Um, I like Googled a lot of it, so I have a general idea about what it means. But according to the medical examiner's reports, there was a gunshot wound to the front left side of Stacy's neck approximately one inch in diameter in the shape of a semicircle. This wound was about 10 inches below the top of her head and three-fourths of an inch from the middle of her neck. 
There were black scalloped smudges around the wound, forming a pattern of three coalescent circles, as well as two red-brown burns going from the chin to the midline and muzzle imprints, suggesting direct contact with the barrel of the gun. Mm. As I mentioned, police had noted no injuries to the front of Stacy's body when they originally analyzed her body at the scene, but they later found a bruise on her chin. Okay. The wound trajectory went from front to back and from left to right at an upward angle 45 degrees from the sagittal plane with an upward incline of 15 degrees. The exit wound to the back right side of Stacy's neck was approximately three inches by one and a half inches and was located about three inches below the ear and seven and one fourth inches below the top of the head. So like... She was shot in, like, the bottom left of her neck, and it, like, exited, like, this way. Okay. Um, it appeared that the bullet had passed through the skin and passed by the trachea and thyroid gland before hitting the spine ligaments and cervical vertebra, fracturing the mid to lateral portion of the C5, C4, and C3, and displaced some bone into the spinal canal. It was also noted that a piece of bone seemed to have exited along with the bullet and landed in Stacy's hair. Okay. The cervical spine was transected and there was a mild hyperemia of the meninges as well as a mild hemorrhage along the basilar artery. Essentially, this means that there was more blood than there should have been in the membranes that lined the skull and the vertebral, vertebral canal and a hemorrhage to the back cerebral arteries. There was a small three centimeter fracture of medial aspect to the right middle cranial fossa going from front to back and ending at the front surface of the petrous ridge with a hemorrhage into the right petrous region. There was some hemorrhaging, hemorrhaging surrounding the cervical cord secondary to the transection at the C4 level. There was gunpowder residue and nitrates found on both the front and the back of Stacy's left hand. Okay. Russell Peterson indicated that this was from Stacy threatening him with the gun and accidentally shooting herself. However, Stacy was right hand dominant and it's unlikely that she would have handled the gun with her left hand. In fact, yeah. he said she was holding it in her right hand. Okay. Based on the autopsy findings, the placement of the gunpowder residue was consistent with a defensive posture and not with any sort of self-inflicted wound. Here, the other thing is, if she was holding it with her left hand, how did it touch the back of her left hand? Mm -hmm. um, this, coupled with the evidence of the wound being a contact wound, led to the manner of death being ruled as a homicide. Stacy's toxicology report showed her blood alcohol as 0.17%. Okay. And at the time of the autopsy, it was noted that she was in complete rigor mortis with liver mortis being purple and posteriorly fixed. The last note I have from the autopsy is that it was noted Stacy had died within 15 minutes of her injury. Okay. During the investigation, police actually reenacted the shooting. Police had measured Stacy's arms and found a woman with arms the same length and generally a similar build to Stacy. Since Stacy only had gunpowder residue on her left hand, police determined this is the only hand she could have used to touch the gun. They had the woman in the reenactment hold the gun in her left hand and hold it to her neck in the same place where Stacy received her fatal shot and the woman was unable to pull her trigger with her arm at this angle. So she's like holding the gun like this and mm -hmm. she can't, she could not pull the trigger. This coincided with the medical, exam uh, medical examiner's report that Stacy could not have held the gun in her left hand and shot herself with it, but instead likely touched the gun with her left hand in a defensive position. Which would make sense with it being on the front and the back of her hand. Yeah, I mean, plus gunpowder residue, like, gunpowder, like, sprays. So even if you went mm -hmm. like this, like, it's not unheard of that, like, it would have, it would, like, go, you know, yeah. ah, around, you know, but in your uh, hands, that would yeah. be hard to manage. 
On June 15th, 2020, Stacy's sister, Wendy, called and spoke to police. She expressed to them that she believed Russell Peterson had killed her sister in 1993 and wanted to ensure the investigation would continue. She also contacted the FBI and an agent Craps met with her at her house, but told her he wouldn't be able to take over the case unless invited by the Sedona PD. About a month later, on July 6th, police called Christina and asked her to participate in a confrontation call with her father. She so this is when? In 2020. Okay. She agreed, but when police called again to schedule the call, she stopped responding. Hmm. In the 30 years Nikki has had to think over the events and details surrounding her mother's murder, one thing she has all one thing has always remained true for her. Her mother would never have attempted to use a gun against Russell Peterson or attempted suicide with her children in the house. Peterson took the girls out on a Jeep excursion the day after the murder when CPS released them back into his care. He told Nicole to tell authorities she wanted to live with him. She did not tell them this, and she never saw him again until a few years ago he liked one of her posts on Facebook. Mm. <coughs> That's so fucking gross. Yuck. When Nikki reached out to police, she was told that the case is currently inactive, and won't be reinvestigated until new evidence comes to light. The Sedona police continued to deny her requests for a meeting, and in March of 2022, they sent a letter to Nikki and Wendy to remind them of the case status and why it isn't being reinvestigated at this time. At the end of the letter, Lieutenant Carl Wack wrote, quote, attempts to intimidate and harass police personnel involved in this investigation, including sworn, non-sworn, legal, or clerical personnel, cannot be tolerated. The level of repeated demands, as well as online attacks of police personnel on their private social media pages, is inappropriate and could rise to the level of harassment, end quote. How Nick, dare someone ask you to do your job? I know. <laughs> Repeatedly. <Ridiculous. laughs> Stop asking me the same question over and over again. Then do what I'm asking, damn! <laughs> Nikki was able to receive a 176-page case file from Sedona PD, but later learned that the full file was 400 pages. Mm. She has no idea what could be in the remaining 224 pages. I just think, like, imagine if your boss asked you to do something over and over again and you didn't do it, and then you were like, harassment, I'm calling the police. (laughs) Don't ask me. Um, Here's, like, my, the thing about the case file. I know that, like, sometimes police, like, keep things out of, like, public, but this case is inactive. When the case is active, yeah. Right, so for what reason are you holding on to 224 pages when you're, you're outright refusing to continue looking at this case well in a lot of jurisdictions like because of that because like there will be laws that you don't have to release documents in an active case they'll leave a case like labeled as active Mm -hmm. although they like won't work on it so like it seems like you could have lied better like yes you could have said like oh no no we are totally still working on your mom's case so we can't send you that file because that's private but instead they said it's absolutely inactive. It's labeled mm-hmm. as inactive, but you still can't have these. Yeah. One thing we've discussed on this podcast is the delicacy that comes with covering true crime cases, specifically when it comes to family members listening in on coverage of the cases. There are many families out there who prefer for their loved ones' cases not to be covered by media sources. There are others like Nikki who need that coverage to bring attention to their cases and to put pressure on law enforcement to work harder on solving them. We will put the petition to reactivate Stacy's case in our show notes. Please consider signing it and please follow Nikki on TikTok to follow along with updates in her mother's case. Her TikTok is at Nicole Wasilition. It's spelled N-I-C-O-L-E-W-A-S-I-L-I-S-H-I-N. 
That's it. Cool. She doesn't have, um, from what I can tell, any other social media, but she posts to the, her TikTok like daily. Yeah. Um, just she will she'll do like frequently asked questions. She will do um, updates. There aren't often updates, but like when she got like that letter from the police, she posted that, and then she'll also post like explanations of the case um, mm-hmm. throughout. So it's a good source if you want to know more. Um, I hope that we did a good job because I know she's gonna listen to it. Um, but yeah, I think like I I here's what I don't understand. At the very least the medical examiner ruled her case a homicide. Right. How are you just, like, legally allowed to just inactivate that? how... And he told you he was the only person there when it happened. How, at the very least, has this man not been charged with, like, manslaughter? Mm Mm-hmm. Like... Or how, at the very least, is the case not still open, but you're, like... Right. We're still collecting evidence. (laughs) Right. I just, like, that is that doesn't make sense to me and I and I personally I agree with Nikki that it doesn't seem like her mom shot at him and then shot herself Mm -hmm. um it doesn't seem like she ever had that gun in in her right hand Mm -hmm. I don't see how she could have possibly shot herself with her left hand so Mm -hmm. like I personally think he should be charged with more than manslaughter but at the very least I don't understand how we've just dropped this case that was literally medically ruled a homicide. Right. And where police said, like, you don't make any sense, sir. Yeah. And then they were yeah. like, eh, just, it's fine. Yeah. Well, hopefully, hi, Nikki, but hopefully <laughs> there will be updates that we can yeah. share in real time. True crime. Yes. As things change or, or maybe there'll be such an update that it'll warrant another yeah. episode. She posted um, a TikTok when we first like got in contact with each other with like a list of podcasts that were covering her mom's case this year. And I know Morbid is covering it. Um, and which is great because it has mm-hmm. much higher yeah. audience than we do. But yeah. like mm-hmm. also like the number of people who had reached out to her just to cover the case in 2024 as of December, it was a pretty long uh, TikTok video. She had quite a Yay. few people and she, in December, when she had emailed me, already 15 had podcasts had been released about it. And then now she has like even more signing on to do it in 2024 since she posted. She's made two parts of people who are covering it two-part videos and people were still commenting and asking if they could cover it so she's got a lot of people talking about it so hopefully it like puts the pressure on them yeah but so does christina like still i I can't do the math right now but like does she still live with russell she a Um, grown she's a grown ass woman now so i guess christina Christina ran away from Russell's care when she was 14. Okay. Um, I, on Nikki's TikTok, she said that Christina became pregnant, I think, when she was 16. And okay. that's around the time that her and Nikki, like, reconnected. But they have since lost touch. They don't speak anymore. And then she had agreed to do this call with police and since then has not responded to their efforts to call him um and has not responded as far as i can tell to nicole or wendy who are like the two main people trying to keep get the case reactivated um so she i don't think she has a relationship with him right now okay but she doesn't have one with like other nicole either either. yeah okay with like her mom's side Yeah. yeah Well, good job. Thank you. And let us know what you thought. Yeah. Theories. Yeah. Opinions. Everything. Thank you. Bye. Bye.